positions. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, where we were last Sunday. In fact, the last several Sunday mornings we've been in Isaiah. I used various texts from Isaiah to preach a couple of Christmas messages after we got through the Christmas cantata and all that that entailed. And, and then I looked at Isaiah again for a New Year's message. And then I just felt led of God to deliver a series of messages from Isaiah chapter 40. And in the midst of Isaiah being called of God to deliver messages of warning and coming judgment to God's people, God also laid on his heart to have him deliver messages of comfort, something that would uplift their soul, something that would give them hope. In fact, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 begins, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. And, and we talked about that last time. But I want to address a subject that is now, sad to say, except in a few circles, rarely preached. It ought to be all the time. In the olden days, it was preached constantly. And that's a message about the coming of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Christ. And... I'm just old-fashioned enough to believe in a thing we call the rapture of the church, a premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture of the church that then when we are changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and following where we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It says, and thus shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. That's something that could happen any moment at any time and we need to be ready for that. Because if you miss it, then you're going to face the coming judgment of God that is known as the Great Tribulation Period. At the end of that, the time to repent, the time to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, absolutely comes to an end. And Jesus Christ comes again in power and great glory to establish His rule and His reign on the earth for a thousand years. And then in the age to come, it'll last forever. This is actually spoken of in Isaiah chapter 40, the second coming of Christ in power and great glory. I want you to stand, if you're able, in the honor reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 9. And I think, although you're, it may show on the screen, I'm going to read down to verse 25. I think I'll simply read down to verse 17 because I think that will be sufficient. But this is what he says. After he said in verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Then he launches into this presentation of the coming of God himself to the earth. He says, O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. And then it begins to answer uh, or ask a series of questions that the obvious answer is no one but God. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the, the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the owls as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering, all the nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him as less than nothing and vanity. And I want to use as a title a subject today, When God Himself Comes to Rule 
and reign. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for our time today. I'm thankful for our time of worship and song and in prayer and in giving. But Lord, now we come to worship through the proclamation of your holy word. Lord, we know that this eye that I've read is the word of God. It's your word. It was, it was your word to Isaiah, to your people in his day, and it is your word to our day. That we might be preparing our own hearts and our own minds and our own soul and spirit to meet you, to meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And Lord, we know that day could come very soon. And that's why we preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for one here that might need to turn and repent of their sin. May they do that this very hour in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Several times, I'm sure I have recounted many of my life stories as a child. And I've recounted to you, and this is, I guess, somewhat odd. I guess that's why I bring it up. But from about the age of eight, maybe seven or eight years old, but I know at least by age of eight, I began to be interested in and read, began to read books probably on my level at that time about the presidents of the United States, great governmental leaders. As I got a little bit older, I began to, to delve into books on politics and such. And this was something that I carried on throughout my adult life, probably until recent years. I have quite an extensive library of books on politics and politicians and presidents and governors and congressmen, etc. Some of these I have met in person. Some of these are autographed, if that's worth anything. But uh, I always had a great interest in this, probably until recent years. When I became so frustrated at the prospect of Christians in America rising up and being able to band together in unity and make some sort of orchestrated change, that I guess I sort of gave up on that prospect and gave up on reading, and I guess I got so frustrated with who we actually had in office, I didn't feel much inspired to read their biography. But I received a, a, an ad through email, because I order stuff off of Amazon.com, and I got this little you know, ad that I get periodically of books they're trying to recommend me. And you know, the, the, the NSA, the government, watches everything we do. And they know who we're calling, and they read our emails. I'm kind, I'm kind of joking, but I'm probably really not. But Amazon watches everything we do, too. They not only know the books I've bought, they know the books I've looked at and didn't buy. And they know the books I've kind of looked at and set aside and say, maybe I'll come back to that one later. And, 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 and they know my browsing history. And so based on my browsing history, they advertised a book by former CIA director and former Secretary of Defense Bill Gates, who's no longer now in office, and he's somewhat writing a tell-all, and they advertised his book, and I read the ad. But not only did I read the ad, but at the bottom of that screen, as you would look at this on computer, if you scroll sideways, there's probably eight or ten books that they're also advertising that are supposed to be similar to the one they think that you have browsed and you think they may be or you may be interested in. And, and so I checked out all those books. Now, these are the most popular political biographies and political uh, um, exposés, I guess, that are on the market right now. Some of these have not even yet been released. They were, they were asking me to, or attempting me to pre-order so when they were released, I could be the first, you know, to, to read this book. Let me tell you some of the titles that they thought I might be interested in that are very popular in the world today. The first one I might read, it's called Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House. It's by Peter Barker, who is a correspondent for the New York Times. There's another book that deals with the war in Iraq called Surge, 
my journey with General David Petraeus and the remaking of the war in Iraq. And I guess it's a, talk, it's a, it's a book about how that surge supposedly put an end to the Iraq war and gave us victory there and they've tried to imitate that in Afghanistan with not a whole lot of success and in the long run I'm not sure what a whole lot of success we've accomplished in Iraq sad to say as they're having bombings and killings and Christians are running for their life out of that country fleeing for safety as they're being persecuted like they've never been in that nation's history this is written by a retired US Army colonel and chair of the military uh, of history, the chair of history at Ohio State University. So all you Buckeye fans can say amen. And then there was a book they thought I might be interested in called The Stranger. It's about his struggles as president. The Stranger, Barack Obama in the White House. It's a tell-all by Chuck Todd that I've seen many times on television. He's the NBC News chief of White House correspondent. And then there was another book, very popular. I think I have to pre-order this one. It's going to be a bestseller. They thought I might be interested. It's called HRC. If you don't know what that stands for, that stands for Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> State Secrets and the Rebirth of Hillary Clinton by Jonathan Allen, White House Bureau Chief for Politico. Then there's another one on her that they thought I might be interested in called The Secretary, A Journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the Heart of American Power. And I think this is almost wishful writing, wishful thinking. It's, it's sort of a puff-up of Hillary Clinton, you know, that she's going to rise to power and be our next president. It's written by BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Company State Department correspondent. And it's supposed she traveled around with uh, Secretary Clinton on her journeys as Secretary of State. Well, such titles and subject matter, as I know they are going to be recounting, you know, the, maybe the supposedly the best of the best of what's going on in politics in our modern era, Really, when I started reading through all this and I understood where they were coming from and I started having visions of what our political future might be, a, a cold shiver went up and down my spine. I know I'm messing and meddling. I know that. In fact, as I began to contemplate what we still may be facing in the future, it could be cause for losing what little sleep I actually get. Such titles also bring to mind the desperate state I think our nation is in for someone to step forward that is sold out to God, that is a true blue, born-again, spirit-filled Christian that loves the Lord, that reads and memorizes scriptures, that commits themselves to living according to God's word day by day and would actually bow the knee and petition God and ask God to give them wisdom and guidance, not just in general, but about specific issues that they're facing in the modern world. We need some real spiritual leaders to also step forward to be political leaders in our day. But I'm not sure we're going to really find any. Experience any. Be blessed by any. Until God Himself leaves his throne on high in the form of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the skies are opened and he descends in power and great glory. And he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, as the Bible says, he, one day he will. And he assumes a throne, the throne of, of what the Bible would call in the flesh his father David, and begins to rule and reign with power and might without opposition in righteousness and justice, establishing the rule of God on planet earth for then and forevermore. And frankly, I look forward to that day. That is our hope. 
Honestly, I believe it is our only hope. The Bible in the New Testament calls the coming of Christ, especially for His church, the church's blessed hope. It's something we should look forward to and pray for. The Bible closes out the book of Revelation by saying, Even so, come Lord Jesus. That ought to be on our heart. It ought to be on our lips. It ought to be in our prayers. We ought to desire and look forward to Him coming we ought to prepare ourselves for that day by placing our faith and trust in Him and by living for Him and by carrying out His mission. And I believe, believe it or not, the book of Isaiah can instruct us, giving us a greater understanding about what this second coming of Christ is going to be about how in some ways we experience the coming of the kingdom even now, but we look forward to that physical coming in the days ahead. And again, I think those days are not very far in the future. So I do have hope for America. But my hope is not based in politics. It's not based in the next election. My hope is placed in the coming of Jesus Christ in power and great glory. I'm going to divide this message up into four major divisions and we're going to talk about this glorious coming, this anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ when God Himself comes to rule and to reign. The first thing I think this passage presents to us in verse 9 is the glorious good news of God's reign. Let me read this again. O Zion! It's the city of God that bringeth good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. The great task of the church, as it was for the prophets of old, is to be a herald, a town crier, one who stands and proclaims the Word of God. Actually, what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, that word gospel, literally out of the Greek, means good news. Euangelion, euangelizo, whatever form it comes in, it is a message of good news and it has the connotation of a king or a powerful ruler commissioning one to go and to declare his word. You know, even in our Revolutionary War days, the early founding of our nation, they had town criers who would come with a big scroll and they would unroll the scroll at the town square and they would say, Hear ye, hear ye. And then they would deliver the message from the king or later on from their governor or congress or whoever it would be. That's, they didn't have email in that day. They didn't have CNN or Fox News Network. They had town criers. And so a herald of the message of Jesus Christ is one that is thought of in Scripture as one who stands and proclaims good news. Now, our world is full of bad news. I can recount it all day long when you turn on your television set and watch CNN or watch Fox, and I don't even want to mention MSNBC. <laughs> Most of what you hear, generally speaking, is bad news. Sad to say, even when I turn on ESPN to watch Sports Center. Half of what they have there is bad news. This coach getting fired, this player getting banned from baseball because he's on steroids or, you know, some scandal that they like to promote. It's bad news here and bad news there. It is bad news everywhere. We need some good news. About 20 years ago, Ted Turner came up with a, a program for TBS, I think, in those days entitled Good News. Sad fact is, it wasn't good enough good news because I don't think the program lasted, but we have the greatest good news the world has ever known. And as I've already said, this says the flower fades, and, 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 but the, 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 the grass withers, but the Word of God is going to stand forever. We have the good news of Jesus Christ that is not just old fogey news. It's not out-of-date news. It is news current and fresh and alive, and it's the good news that one day Jesus Christ is going to come again. 
And He's going to put an end to all this horror that we live through in our modern life. He'll put an end to violence, an end to warfare, an end to, uh, to, uh, to nation rising up against nation and people taking advantage of one another. He'll, he'll put an end to the dope smoking in, uh, in, uh, in Colorado and, and, and all the abortions taking place in America. He'll put an end to divorce. He'll put an end to child abuse. He'll put an end to church worship service skippers. They're all going to know the Lord and they'll all fill the pew and we'll all worship and sing praises to God and we'll lift our voices it's all going to come because one day Jesus Christ is coming again and he's going to reign he will rule and he will reign without opposition in perfection and it's going to be glorious for one I, I, I look forward to that day can I even say again it even talks about the manner to some degree of his coming the Bible does and the Bible talks about the heavens are going to be opened. There's going to be signs in the heavens. The stars will fall from their place. The moon shall be turned to blood. There's going to be earthquakes and there, it's going to be a dramatic scene like we can't see. And Jesus Christ is not going to need Air Force One. He'll not need the Marine One to come in for the landing. He'll just appear from the sky, escorted by angels, escorted by all His saints. And He'll descend to heaven and there'll be a worship and praise like we've not seen any time in human history. That's the glorious good news of the coming of Christ, the glorious good news of God's reign. Second thing this teaches is the awesome might of God's reign. Verse 10 says this, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him, Behold, his reward is with him and his works before him. One of the tragedies, I guess, of Christian so-called art, especially in the Renaissance, the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, which would be the you know, 14, 1500s, then 16 and 1700s, is oftentimes these artists render Jesus as a little wimpy, skinny, frail, wisp of a man and I think number one on earth on planet earth Jesus was anything but that we think of carpenters nowadays and most of them are men's men anyway but they you know making cabinetry and and and, and making furniture etc etc but carpenters in Jesus's day they were like construction workers they built houses, they built buildings, they built, they, they had big beams they had to carry. They had to carry all that heavy equipment and be able to saw and hammer and chisel and nail and all those sorts of things just by his very uh, job before and vocation before he set off at age 30 to do what he knew God all along had called him to do. He was God's son. He did this sort of work and he was a man's man. He was not some little skinny, wimpy whip with a limp wrist. He was strong. But that doesn't even really come into play with what I'm talking about right now. Jesus is coming as a strong, powerful, unopposed, all-wise, all-knowing king that no one will be able to stand against. Oh, they're going to try. Just get out the book of Revelation and see. Read about the battle of Armageddon. They are marshalling, Satan is marshalling his forces through the Antichrist. And they're all battled and gathered together to do battle at that place called Armageddon. And then you see in the book of Revelation how there comes one riding on a white horse. He has on his thigh written the name, the Word of God. His vesture, the Bible says, is dipped in blood. And he comes and slays the wicked just with the, with the fiery breath of judgment coming from his mouth. They are laid waste. They are cast into the lake of fire. All who opposed him are done away and cast out of his kingdom. And he starts it afresh and starts it anew and rules and reigns without opposition 
And again, I look forward to such a day. Now, one of those books I mentioned, the one about Barack Obama called The Stranger. There's another book that was written called The Amateur, but this book, The Stranger, honestly is about the frustrations because I read the little synopsis of the book. It's about the, 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 the frustrations that our president has faced coming in with all these ideas and all these new things he wanted to do and he just felt like all was going to fall in line and they would pass all the bills he wanted to get passed and they would get, you know, give all the help to the, to the helpless that you know, he wanted to give and, and everybody would just bow at his feet and grovel, I suppose. I don't know. They would just step out of the way and let him do what he wanted. And he's found even his own party members don't do that. Everybody's vying for their own position of power, and he can't get done what he wants to get done. I'm going to meddle again. Can I just apologize after the message is over for this, what I'm about to say? I'm not sure I like half of what he's got to do and, and, and gotten done. I'm scared what would it really be if he got done all he wanted to get done, but, you know, that's just beside the point. But he's frustrated. And his own party doesn't often stand with him, much less the opposition party. But when Jesus Christ comes again in power and great glory, there's not going to be competing parties. You won't have to run for office. Uh, you, you, you won't have to go through the primary system. You won't have judges stepping in and say you can't do that. You won't have filibuster saying we're not even going to let you speak and, and let you pass your bill. It'll be Jesus Christ issues the word. It's going to get done. They'll fall in line. They'll march to his order. They will obey his every word or they will be cast out of his kingdom. And I look forward. I look forward to that day. The awesome might of the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Behold, the Lord will come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. But not only is he coming to rule and reign, the Bible says, with a rod of iron, unopposed. But he's also coming to bless. Because not only does this text, as it talks about the appearance of God himself to rule and reign. Not only does it talk about the gracious good news of God's reign, the awesome might of God's reign, but it talks about the gracious blessing. The gracious blessing of God's reign. He's come to bless. Oh yes, He's come to judge. But He's come to bless. Look at what it says in verse 11. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. And he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. That's the tender, loving care. Personal care. Provisional care. Of our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. When I read that passage, I thought of, I guess, the most famous psalm out of the book of Psalms in our Bible, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down by green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And it concludes by saying that I will dwell, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's blessing. That is comfort. That is provision. That's what Jesus comes to be. Our great shepherd. For those that bow the knee right now, He can be your shepherd now. For those that bow the knee right now, He'll be your Lord and Master right now. He'll bless you and guide your every step and, and answer your prayer and give you direction in life. And He'll comfort you and bless you and provide for your every need. That's the Jesus that we serve and worship. And it's the one that's coming back to earth one of these days in power and great glory. But the thing is, for him to rule and reign over you then, he must rule and reign over you now. And for him to bless you with abundant blessing then, you must understand and seek his blessing as your good shepherd right now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to receive Him as Savior and Lord and Master and Shepherd and King of your life. The 
The fourth thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture is the unmatched supremacy of God's reign. You know, I wish as a, a husband and a father I always made wise decisions. But I know the truth of the matter is I do not. And now if I were to get on my knees and seek God as I should and really be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit to be filled with that Spirit and walk in the Spirit and be guided by the Spirit and do that perfectly in my life, I think I would generally be a wise husband and a wise father leading my family. But oftentimes we get self-sufficient and we close our eyes to the truth and we try to have it our own way or our selfish uh, uh, gains and desires and and fleshly motivations in life tend to take over, and we make foolish choices and decisions. I wish as a pastor, as a pastor, I could always wake, make wise choices, always have heard from God. Everything I would ever say or do or recommend or every sermon I would preach, it would be absolutely perfect in the eyes of God and absolutely according to His will. I work hard on my preaching. As long as I preach the Word, I'm pretty safe. Now, when I start meddling, I guess I did a little bit today, y'all may have all it against me, and I'll just apologize later, maybe. If I, you know, you may be the one that needs to repent instead of me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I wish we were all wise and all-knowing. Now, if I'm making that confession, that, that gives me right to make accusation, I guess. But I wish our political leaders would make all wise and all-knowing decisions. I, I wish they would not make mistakes. I, I wish they would not, you know, run after something that was never God's will, was not good for our nation, that would not bring victory militarily or victory economically or whatever the case in our, our country. I, I wish they were guided by the Spirit and led by the Spirit. But half of them need to get saved before that can even begin to happen in their lives. And that's why husbands and fathers make foolish decisions. It's why pastors make foolish decisions. And it's why our political leaders make foolish decisions. Because oftentimes we're operating in the flesh and we're not operating according to God's will with the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit affecting every aspect of our life. But one of these days there's a ruler coming who will be the King of kings and Lord of lords and God Himself who is all wise, He is all knowing, He knows everything that ever has ever been able to be known. Because He created all things that we see. And he will rule this world in absolute, utter perfection without any error or mistake. Everything he does will be in the perfect will of the Trinity, the Godhead. And everything he does will be for our good, for our blessing. There are those in our modern day that doubt the wisdom of God. They doubt the wisdom of Scripture. In fact, they denigrate God. They denigrate the Bible. They think it's outdated, outmoded. We need to wad it up, throw it away, and go after something else of our own making. Whether you realize it or not, there is on the rise in America, especially among young people, there's the rise of out-and-out -out avowed atheism. Whereas a matter of faith, really, as a matter of statement, a matter of official position in their own heart and mind, they are claiming there is no God. Of course, the Bible has a word for them we're supposed to not take lightly. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And if that's the case, we're becoming a nation of fools. Now, actually, in the Hebrew, the word the is not there. So it says, the fool has said in his heart, no God. And what that means, even if there is one, we don't want one, don't want to be ruled by one, and will not acknowledge the wisdom and honor and integrity and, and, and morality of one, we want to be the God of our own life. And if that would be the case, then we're doubly so a nation of fools. Because we are foolishly turning our back 
on the one thing that can lead us in paths of righteousness, and that's the Word of God. And because we're turning our back on the Word of God, we're turning our back on the person that desires to be the ruler, Lord, and master of our life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is our only hope. And can I just go ahead and say right now, He also is, as I've already said, He's, he's perfect in His knowledge, perfect in His understanding as I'll reread. But Jesus knows more than the Supreme Court. Jesus knows more than Harvard educated or Yale educated or, or, or Oxford educated presidents. He knows more than the governor. He knows more than the state legislators. He knows more than Congress. Actually, that ain't hard to do. He knows more than the Senate. He knows more than the scientists. Jesus knows the theory of evolution is a joke. There's no scientific basis whatsoever. He knows in the beginning, God said, let there be, and it came to pass just like that. He's smart enough and wise enough to know that man's version of morality is no morality at all and it's the path that leads to destruction and yet the world right now doesn't want to listen to him they won't yield to his knowledge they will not yield to his wisdom they will not acknowledge his supreme intelligence his supreme ability to rule and reign over the throne of our own life as he will one day over the whole world but i'm just telling you there is nobody that can match jesus this says again, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out, he uh, out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountain in scales and the hills in a balance. Hey, Jesus know how, much, how many grains of sand there is on the seashore. He knows how much the oceans weigh. He knows how big the universe is. We're just now trying to discover a fraction of it. He already knows because he made it all. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Nothing was made without Him. Everything that was made was made through by Him. He's Creator. He knows it all. It also says, with whom took He counsel, and who instructed Him, and taught Him in the paths of judgment, and taught Him knowledge, and showed Him the way of understanding. Again, all the Harvard and Yale and, and Princeton and, and all these guys think they're all so smart, and the Bible is outdated and all moated. They are morons in the sight of God compared to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All the nations, including ours, with its nuclear power, its economy like the world has never known, its ability to invent and aspire and achieve and put men on the moon and satellites and such out beyond our solar system, all that we've achieved, all our national pride, all that we think we are. Number one, it's all a blessing from God. We are a nation that has been blessed by God, and without God, we are nothing. And I want to tell you, compared to God, and compared to the Lord Jesus Christ, our nation and all nations are nothing. Our economic system is nothing. Our political system is nothing. Our founding documents, compared to God, I, I admire them, but compared to God, this says they are nothing. And one day they will all be set aside and Jesus will rule in perfect righteousness based on his own wisdom. It says, all nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Backing up to verse 15, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Back when some of you were children, maybe, maybe adults, with the rise of the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler, he used to have his parades through the streets, and he would, I mean, he, he would have 100,000, it seemed like, soldiers march in that goose step order, and they would all be decked out in uniform, and then would come the tanks and the missiles, and that was supposed to put fear and awe and trembling into any nation that would dare rise against him. And when they were 
rush. Then the Soviet Union did the same thing. They would have their great parades and, and parade their missiles, you know, in sort of a 45-degree a angle, seemingly ready to launch. And they would have their vast armies on parade. And in the great height of the Cold War, that was supposed to instill fear in the hearts and minds of those who would dare stand against the Soviet communist might. We were just supposed to acquiesce and give in. And God stood on His throne in heaven or sat on His throne in heaven and just laughed. Because all of that is a drop in the bucket to a single spoken word of the Lord Jesus Christ who one day is coming to rule and reign with power and might. And I think that day is not very far off in our future. And we need to get ready right now. As I said, now, today's that day of salvation. Today's the day to repent. Today's the day to get our heart and ready for this coming King. And when He comes, His reign will be glorious. And I look forward to the day I can bow the knee and worship Him in person as my Savior and my Lord. And I pray you'd be able to do the same thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for our time this morning. And I'm so grateful you've allowed me to stand and preach this message. And Lord, I pray that now that it would bear much fruit for souls. Lord, I pray for one that's not ready. Lord, I pray for our nation as a whole. Because our nation as a whole is not ready. It's not ready to meet Jesus Christ face to face. And one day He is coming. And all our leaders will have to step off their positions of, uh, uh, of leadership and authority and it will all be yielded then to Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for one that needs Jesus as Savior. May they repent of their sin, receiving full, absolute forgiveness of that sin. And may they come to know what it is to worship and serve a risen Savior who is not only their Savior, but their Lord and Master and the ruler of their life. Father, may you bless this time of invitation for the one that needs to come in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation as God is touching your heart, calling you to come for salvation or for church membership. You're already a believer. You just want to come and be a part of the Macklin Baptist Church family. You step out from where you are right now.